A brand that produces unique cars, famous worldwide for their safety. A brand that has become a model of reliability in the automotive industry. A company that manufactures the most technologically advanced, aggressive, and sporty, as well as very modern cars conquering one market after another. Volvo. Initially, the creators of the brand were guided by the idea that in an ideal world, people need high-tech, safe transportation, and they began to develop ideas in this direction. Since then, dozens of innovations have been implemented in Volvo cars, many of which are so unique that they have received international awards. For the creators of Volvo, it has always been important to maintain the quality of their cars. Thanks to this, the brand is highly valued in the automotive world. The history of Volvo dates back to the distant 1920s. It has gone through its difficult path thanks to its technologies and ideas that made the entire automotive world believe in them. Today, we will tell you how the Volvo brand was born, from bearings to full-fledged cars, how the company tried to conquer the taxi market, why Volvo was one of the first to switch to gas as fuel, the rigorous testing of its cars, and incredible concept cars, the most famous developments of the company that conquered the entire automotive world World, how Ford absorbed the Volvo brand and why the company is currently owned by China. This is the unique story of the Volvo brand. Let's go. In 1924, in the Stockholm restaurant Sturhoff, on July 25th, a day known in the Swedish calendar as Jakob's Day, Asser Gabrielsson and Gustav Larsson made the decision to create Volvo. Over several years of working at SKF, Asser Gabrielsson noted that Swedish ball bearings were inexpensive compared to international standards, and the idea of creating Swedish cars that could compete with American ones grew stronger. Asser Gabrielsson worked with Gustav Larsson for several years at SKF, and the two, having also worked together for several years in the British automotive industry, learned to recognize and respect each other's experience and know-how. Gustav Larsson also had plans to create his own Swedish automotive industry. Their similar views and goals led to cooperation, resulting in the decision to establish a Swedish car company. While Gustav Larsson hired young mechanics to assemble cars, Asser Gabrielsson studied the economic ground for their project. In the summer of 1925, Asser Gabrielsson had to use his own savings to finance a trial series of products consisting of 10 passenger cars with financial support from SKF, which produced ball bearings. In 1926, a prototype was made. The car was equipped with a 1.9-liter four-cylinder side valve engine designated as AB4. It was offered with an open body, and the BB4 variant was a sedan. The production of the first Volvo car involved many different specialists who assembled the cars by hand. The OV4 car, affectionately called Jakob, rolled off the assembly line of the small Volvo plant in Gothenburg. From this day, the era of Swedish industrial history began. Jakob was designed in an American style, had a powerful chassis and independent suspension with long leaf springs at the front and rear. The four-cylinder engine developed 28 horsepower at 2,000 revolutions per minute. The car's maximum speed was 56 miles per hour, although Volvo recommended keeping the speed around 38 miles per hour. The car had artillery-type wheels with natural-colored wooden spokes and removable rims. The open five-seater body had four doors and was constructed constructed of sheet steel on an ash and copper beach frame. The basic version cost 4,800 Swedish kroner, and the closed version P4 cost 5,800 Swedish kroner. At the start of production, sales were quite low over the course of one year. Only 297 cars were sold. One of the reasons for this low number was the requirement for a very high level of quality of supplied components and strict control by the manufacturer. Interest in the closed model turned out to be much stronger than in the open top model, so the initial plan to produce 500 open cars and 500 closed cars was quickly revised. Then the Volvo Special model was introduced. It was an extended version of the PV4 with a longer hood, streamlined dashboard lines, narrower windshield pillars, a rectangular rear window, and bumpers as standard equipment. In 1928, Volvo produced its first truck, Type 1. Several small minibuses were constructed on the Jakob 
chassis as early as 1927, and truck production was planned as early as 1926 when the first drawings were developed. The truck venture was a clear success. Trucks and a little later buses dominated Volvo's production during the first decades. Starting with Yaka, Volvo developed the idea of creating a six-cylinder engine. The production of four-cylinder cars gradually gave way to six-cylinder engines after the production of 996 cars instead of the planned thousand. In April 1929, the first six-cylinder Volvo car, the PV651, was introduced. PV stood for person von, car in Swedish, 651, six-cylinder engine, five seats, and the first series. The PV651 was longer and wider, with a stronger frame than Jakob. The 650 version was the same model supplied without body trim. The more powerful engine was well-received, especially in the taxi market, which Volvo aimed to enter. During the year, 1383 cars were sold, 27 of them for export. After the positive reception of the PV651 model in the taxi market, the time began to demand the production of a larger car for taxis. In March 1930, Volvo released the first seven-seater models, TR671 and TR672. The chassis, the same as the PV650 and PV651, was extended. From this time, the distinction between Volvo designations for passenger cars and taxis appeared. Sedans were part of the PV650 series, with the numbers in the name indicating that it was a six-cylinder, five-seater car. Taxis were designated as the TR670 series, where the numbers indicated that it was a seven-seater car. Car sales fell due to the international economic crisis, but despite this, Volvo maintained its market share of 8%. General Motors, which had a Chevrolet assembly line in Stockholm, accused Volvo of not producing a truly Swedish product. Volvo changed its policy so that 90% of all cars were sold in Sweden. From this point on, Volvo cars were advertised as Swedish cars. In January 1932, some significant changes were made to the car model. The idea was to reduce fuel consumption by about 20%. By May, Volvo had produced 10,000 cars since the start of mass production. 3,800 of them were passenger cars and 6,200 were trucks. In 1933, Gustav Eriksson introduced a special hand-built car, produced then in a single version. It was called Venus Billo. Its purpose was to explore the market for a modern streamlined car. It generated great interest, but opinions were divided when it came to its production. Mass production was never considered, but Venus Billo paved the way for the development and production of more streamlined models. 1935 was a year of great success for Volvo. The big news was the new PV36 model. The streamlined PV36 was a completely new car, largely grown out of American design principles. The engine was the same as in conservative models, but the gearbox did not have a neutral gear. The car had a split windshield, rear wheel covers, an integrated luggage compartment, and a spacious interior, and it weighed 1660 kilograms. A lot of work was done to improve the comfort of the car, and the rear seat was wider than in previous models. The car was a six-seater, three seats in the front and three in the back. The PV36 was intended as a relatively expensive luxury model. Its price was 8,500 Swedish kroner, so a series of only 500 cars was planned, and this was justified. Later, in subsequent production and sales, the PV36 was nicknamed Karaoke, possibly because Karaoke was the name of a South American dance that was very fashionable and stylish at the time. In 1936, a simpler, cheaper model was developed alongside the PV36. It was named the PV51 and was met with great interest. Although it was more expensive than most other cars in its class, consumers were willing to pay a few hundred kroner more for this first truly popular car bearing the name associated with Volvo's quality. The PV51 did not have the same extreme lines as the PV36, but its character was the same. The body was already with a flat, undivided windshield. The rear part of the door was similar to the PV36 model, and the spare tire, as in that model, was placed in the luggage compartment. The engine was the same, with a power of 86 horsepower, with a slightly reduced weight of 1,500 kilograms. This made the PV51 much faster than earlier models. In 1938, two new models for taxis appeared, the PV801 with a partition, and the PV802 without a partition. This model was also presented in the PV810 version, the chassis with a large wheel 
wheelbase had rounded shapes and a fashionable wedge-shaped front end. Both versions were equipped with eight seats, the driver, and seven passengers. Three seats were foldable. On the eve of World War II, problems with fuel shortages began. An alternative to gasoline was gas produced from coal. Volvo began developing a device for switching to gas, thus preparing in advance for competition. Volvo management decided to start production of a new model to replace the PV50 series. Preliminary plans were already ready, but production did not start as the war put an end to the production of personal cars. World War II brought hard times for everyone, including Volvo. Sales fell from 7,306 cars to 5,900. The reasons were restrictions on the use of gasoline, a shortage of materials and components. The decline in sales was somewhat compensated by production within the framework of the Swedish defense industry. The Volvo engineering department took full control of the development of gas-powered devices and special military vehicles. In 1941, the PV-60, a large American-style car, was supposed to be the successor to the PV-50 model. Deliveries, which were planned from May 1940, had to be canceled. Nevertheless, Volvo produced several prototypes with different body solutions. The rear doors of these cars were attached to the rear edge of the opening, and the door hinges were relatively small. Volvo planned to have this car ready for production by the end of the war. In 1943, plans for the post-war period were taking shape. A new smaller car, named the PV444, was planned for production. At this stage, Volvo already knew that the car would be unique, as it combined American style with European dimensions. As it later turned out, this combination was very successful. It was also decided that the PV444 would have a four-cylinder engine and rear-wheel drive. The body design was heavily influenced by American models, and there was no doubt that the all-steel body would make a strong impression on the Swedish market. The engine, a four-cylinder version with a short flywheel, was very economical and developed 40 horsepower. It became known as the B4B and was the smallest engine produced by Volvo at the time. Additionally, it was the first engine with an overhead camshaft. The gearbox was a three-speed with synchronizers on the top two gears. This car was also the first in the world to be equipped with a safety innovation, laminated windshield glass. The PV444 was first shown at a major Volvo exhibition in Stockholm, where it attracted great interest. The day before the exhibition opened, the price of the PV444 was announced at 4,800 Swedish kroner, a very attractive price, the same as for the first Volvo car, the PV4, 17 years earlier. During the exhibition and the following days, 2,300 contracts were signed. Interest in the model was so great that people were willing to pay twice as much for a contract with an earlier delivery date. By 1945, Volvo had already sold 10,181 cars out of the planned 12,000. The production rate was low, and it took some time for the PV444 to become a common sight on the roads. The first 2,300 cars, for which contracts had already been signed, were sold at a loss. The price of 4,800 kroner announced at the Stockholm exhibition was still in effect, although the actual price had risen to 8,000 kroner by that time. 20 years after its founding, Volvo had become a large large concern with an annual turnover of 112 million and nearly 3,000 workers. The end of the war led to a sharp increase in demand for cars, and Volvo truck sales doubled, while buses increased sixfold. Car production in 1946 was at its highest level in Volvo's history. Nearly 3,000 cars were produced in a year. Production of the PV60 gradually increased, and the 800 series taxis remained at the same level. 1949 was the first year since the beginning of operations when Volvo finally produced more passenger cars than trucks and buses. The Volvo Duet was introduced in the summer of 1953. The name Duet symbolized Volvo's idea of a two-in-one car for both work and leisure. In 1954, Volvo's plans to create a two-seater sports car came as a big surprise to everyone. Volvo had a reputation for making good, sturdy cars, perhaps slightly boring, but nevertheless. The prototype of this car, made of reinforced fiberglass with puncture-protected tires, was presented in June. The car was named the Volvo P1900 Sport, and it was initially intended for export. Prototypes were shown during a promotional tour in Sweden. In November, Volvo presented another surprise 
that astonished the entire Swedish automotive world, a five-year warranty on cars. According to this warranty, Volvo undertook to cover all repair costs above 200 kroner resulting from an accident or mishap for five years. This warranty was included in the price of the new car, and since Volvo had lowered prices in 1953, it was very attractive. The Swedish Private Insurance Commission decided that such a warranty contradicted insurance laws and sued Volvo. This was the beginning of a four-year struggle, which Volvo eventually won. The big news of 1956 was the Volvo 120, known in Scandinavia as the Amazon. This model was the result of extensive research involving several versions. The car was produced as a four-door and got its look thanks to a split grille, curved fenders, and large wheels. The body was a monocoque construction with anti-corrosion treatment. The equipment was new and different from previous models. The engine was a new development called the B16A with a power of 60 horsepower. For the first time, Volvo released a car in a two-tone combination. The price was 12,600 Swedish kroner. The car was known as the Amazon only in Scandinavia, as the manufacturer had patented the name on the continent. Thus, outside Scandinavia, the car was called the Volvo 121, or in the sports version, the 122 as Volvo management decided to focus on internationalizing its sales, with conquering the American market being particularly important. Production of the Amazon began in 1957. A lot of work was done to improve safety. The top of the dash dashboard was padded, and snap-in seatbelts on the front seats became standard. The PV444 was fitted with the same engine as the Amazon, the B16, and the grille now had a finer mesh pattern. Between 1950 and 1957, Volvo produced more than 4,000 taxis, and Swedish taxis mainly consisted of these large black Volvo cars. By this time, the company employed 13,000 people, and more than 50,000 cars had been produced. In 1958, Volvo presented another surprise, the PV544, an evolution of the PV444 with a more modern design. Many thought the PV444 would disappear after the Amazon appeared, but despite its slightly old-fashioned look, the car was still modern. Thanks to changes in the body and good driving characteristics, the windshield on the 544 model was larger, it was solid and slightly convex. The rear window was also larger, the rear lights were increased and the dashboard received the same horizontal speedometer as the Amazon. The 544 version was produced in four variants with different engines and equipment. Volvo's turnover exceeded 1 million kroner and the 100,000 export mark was surpassed this year. The Amazon and PV 544 were equipped with three-point seat belts, and Volvo became the first car manufacturer in the world to equip its cars with seat belts as standard equipment. The Volvo 122S and PV 544 began selling in the USA in April 1959. During this year, 39,016 Volvo cars were registered in Sweden, the highest number compared to previous years. At the Brussels Auto Show in January 1960, Volvo presented its sports car, the completely new P1800 model. This two-seater sports coupe had a completely new B18B engine. For the first few years, the car was assembled in England, as there was simply no capacity at the overloaded Volvo plant in Gothenburg to assemble another model. This Volvo model became very famous thanks to its role in the film The Saint, where the main character Simon Templer, Roger Moore, drove this car. The PV544 and Amazon models received new gearboxes this year. The seats had a new design, and their backs were made to give more room to the knees of rear passengers. The Volvo insurance company was born this year, and Volvo car owners could get insurance from this company after the warranty on the PV models expired. The annual number of cars produced exceeded 80,000. In August 1966, a new model that Volvo engineers had been working on for so long was introduced. Previously known under the working name 1400, it was now called the Volvo 144. This car set a new standard in terms of safety. It had all disc brakes, a collapsible steering column, new locks on the three-point seat belts. The body had energy-absorbing crumple zones at the front and rear, and even the door locks had a safe design. The 144 model also marked the introduction of a diagonally split dual circuit braking system. The car had two brake circuits, and if one of them failed, the system still performed 80% of its functions. The 144 model was released with two different engines, the B18A, developing 85 horsepower with a single carburetor, and the B18B, developing 115 horsepower with a twin carburetor. The version with the more powerful engine was called the 144S.
The 140 series also marked a new Volvo designation system. The first digit was the model number, the second, the number of cylinders, and the third, the number of doors. The Volvo 144 received an excellent reception from the press and potential buyers. The 144 model was chosen as the 1966 car of the year in Sweden. The new sporty Amazon 123 GT was also produced this year. The engine was the same as on the 1800S and the gearbox was a four speed with overdrive. The Volvo 144 model achieved great success abroad as well. Volvo celebrated its 40th anniversary with all flags flying. In the USA, the 144 model met all new safety regulations even before they were introduced. The standard equipment of the Volvo 144 in the States costs $2,995. In June 1967, the two-door version 142S was unveiled to the public. It was lighter and cheaper than the four-door. The Volvo 145 Estate was also released this year. Technically speaking, this car was identical to other models. The rear door was solid and open outward with hinges located on the roof. The Volvo 164, a prestigious version with exclusive interior trim and power steering, was introduced in 1968. The engine was a six-cylinder producing 145 horsepower. The interior was much more luxurious than the 140 series. The front end was extended to accommodate the larger engine. This car reached a speed of 175 kilometers per hour. The base model 164 cost 25,500 Swedish kroner. Also this year, the Amazon was equipped with the same dual circuit braking system as the 140 series. The 123 GT model ceased to be sold on the Swedish market. Now the 140 series was breaking sales records in Sweden. It was the best selling car. In the UK, Volvo sales increased by 70% during this year. An assembly plant with a capacity of 2,500 cars was opened in Malaysia. 1971 was a year of new growth in sales. Sales had been growing for 20 years. During this year, 214,000 cars were produced. Volvo became a giant in the automotive industry in Scandinavia. In the UK, sales increased by almost 50%. This year, the most powerful car ever produced by Volvo was introduced, the Volvo 164E. The engine had electronic fuel injection and developed 175 horsepower. The emphasized sleek elongated profile gave the car a sporty character, which also had a large trunk. The need for a smaller car was the most frequent feedback from Volvo dealers. This led to Volvo acquiring 33% of DAF's shares in the Netherlands. Another reason was that Volvo wanted to establish a strong presence in Europe. In 1972, Volvo presented the Vesi, an experimental car looking far into the future. The V-Sig was essentially a mobile laboratory where various safety-enhancing components such as anti-lock brakes, airbags, and telescopic bumpers were developed and tested. In 1973, production was in full swing when the first clouds of the first oil crisis appeared on the horizon. This year, production was at its highest level in Volvo's history. The United States became the largest market after Sweden. Few could have predicted then that an international economic downturn was imminent. Large bumpers began to be installed on models this year, as required by US standards. The new generation of Volvo cars, the Volvo 240 with six different modifications, and the Volvo 260 with two modifications. These cars had a new front end derived from the experimental VES car. The 240 series was equipped with the new B21 engine. This new six-cylinder engine was the first fruit of the joint venture between Volvo and Peugeot for the development of car engines. The production of the 240 and 260 series made Volvo a leader among global car manufacturers in terms of safety. During 1975, two more new models were introduced, the Volvo 265 and the Volvo 66. The Volvo 265 was an exclusive estate car providing excellent comfort with its six-cylinder engine. The Volvo 66 finally gave the company an entry into the small car market. The Volvo 66 was an improved DF66, a pleasant city car with a variomatic transmission. It was previously produced in the Netherlands at the DAF plant, which was renamed Volvo Car this this year. Also this year, the Swedish Automobile Association awarded Volvo a gold medal for safety devices such as daytime running lights and the design of the master brake cylinder.
In 1976, the Volvo 343 from the Netherlands stepped onto the scene. This was a car completely developed from scratch at Volvo Car. With the Volvo 343, the company's management targeted the new but rapidly growing mid-size car market. The first model was equipped with a 1.4 liter engine and a variomatic transmission. Despite its seemingly small exterior, the interior volume of this car offered plenty of space. The large rear luggage compartment, powerful leaf springs of the Dedeon rear suspension system, and folding seats made this car very practical. Initially received by the public without much enthusiasm due to its imperfect design, after modifications, the 340 series model along with the 240 and 260 series became Volvo's best sellers throughout the 70s and 80s. Volvo was the first in the world to introduce a three-way catalytic converter with a lambda sensor, which reduced harmful gas emissions by approximately 90%. In 1977, the Volvo 262C was also introduced. This was a very exclusive model, created with the help of Italian designer Bertone's designs. The seats were made of leather, and the car was equipped with air conditioning, power windows and mirrors, and an audio system. The engine was the same as in the 260 series models. A 140 horsepower V6 engine with a displacement of 2.7 liters. In 1979, Volvo increased production by 25% and sold over 310,000 cars, including the 4 millionth car produced by Volvo. The French manufacturer Renault and Volvo signed an agreement on cooperation in production, development, and product advancement. Engines jointly developed by Renault and Volvo were installed in the 300, 400, and 600 series for a long time. For several years, Renault was also a major shareholder in Volvo Car Corporation. The 1980 models were presented in August and were very well received in the market. In addition to the six-cylinder diesel, the new 240 series models were supplemented with a 2.1-liter four-cylinder engine. After a decade of problems, Volvo developed an aggressive product development strategy in the 1980s. The automotive industry in general faced difficulties this year. Demand for cars in the West as well as in Japan fell by 2.4 million cars over the course of the year, reaching around 30 million. Despite this, Volvo maintained its market share amid the overall decline. On February 2nd, 1982, Volvo unveiled the new Volvo 760. This new exclusive model was shown at a press conference held simultaneously across Europe. In terms of style, quality, and safety, this was a car ahead of its time. The Volvo 760 was produced with two different engines, the six-cylinder petrol B2080 and the new turbocharged six-cylinder diesel TD24. With the TD24 engine, the Volvo 760 reached a speed of 100 kilometers per hour in 13 seconds, making it the fastest diesel car in the world at that time. The Dutch 300 series also underwent a number of innovations in the interior and dashboard, but the biggest news was the 360 GLT with the well-known B19E engine, which was also equipped with a computerized injection system. In 1983, it became clear that the three Volvo model series had reached an ideal market position. Despite the downturn in the automotive market, Volvo's sales were growing in almost every market. In one year, production increased by 54,000 cars, reaching another annual record of 372,400 cars. The 760 GLE model also began to be sold with a turbocharged 2.3 liter engine. The most popular Popular models from the 300 series, the 360 GLT were equipped with a new powerful engine that accelerated it to 100 kilometers per hour in 10 and a half seconds. Volvo introduced the future project, LCP 2000 Light Component Project. These four experimental cars attracted international interest due to the materials used, design, and low fuel consumption. It was time for the next important addition to the 700 series, the Volvo 740. The first two models GLE and Turbo brought new strength to the Volvo program. The Volvo 740 was equipped with a low friction engine. The Volvo 740 GLE was equipped with a 2.3 liter four-cylinder engine with electronic ignition. 
The Volvo 740 Turbo was equipped with a very powerful 2.3 liter turbocharged engine producing 182 horsepower and also equipped with an intercooler. The Volvo 740 was also introduced in a diesel version with a 6-cylinder 2.4 liter engine with and without turbocharging. The strength and determination of Volvo car were confirmed by an extensive investment program for the 1980s totaling 20,000 Swedish kroner. 1985 was filled with brilliant automotive news. The Volvo 780, a new exclusive two-door car developed in collaboration with Carrozzeria Bertone in Turin, Italy, was unveiled to the public at the Geneva Motor Show. Volvo Car in the Netherlands presented the Volvo 480 ES, a sporty four-seater car. Sales and production continued to grow for the sixth year, reaching nearly 400,000 cars. 1987 saw the introduction of the new Volvo 760. The most notable exterior innovations were the smoother lines. Driving characteristics were also improved through the independent rear suspension Volvo Multi-Link. Microprocessor controlled climate control and ABS also debuted this year. A sunroof, automatic lift control, power windows, power rearview mirrors, and central locking were all standard features of this model. Production of the Volvo 760 was concentrated at the Kalmar plant. The Volvo 780 was also equipped with a new rear axle and climate control. The anti-lock braking system, ABS, was installed on the Volvo 740 and Volvo 480. In 1990, the appearance of the Volvo 960 marked another step forward. It was equipped with a six-cylinder, three-liter engine, producing 204 horsepower and an electronically controlled automatic transmission. The new B634F engine had two camshafts and 24 valves. The Volvo 960 replaced the 760. These cars were equipped with a steering wheel airbag, a center headrest on the rear seat for the middle passenger, and a child seat built into the rear seat armrest. Volvo Car Corporation's safety developments were repeatedly recognized by international organizations. In 1990, for the integrated child seat and three-point seat belts for this seat, Volvo was awarded the Prince Michael and Automobile Club of Great Britain Prize. That same year, an agreement was signed between Volvo and Renault for joint work in the production of passenger cars, trucks, and buses. In June 1991, Volvo Car Corporation presented the Volvo 850 GLT. According to experts, this was a model that incorporated four technical innovations, a transversely mounted five-cylinder engine, Delta Link rear suspension, side impact protection, and automatic seatbelt tensioners for the front seats during a collision. This model was undoubtedly the most advanced among other Volvo models produced in the early 90s. The side impact protection system introduced in this model was soon used on other models. The 850 series featured new design headrests, and the steering column was made safer and became adjustable both vertically and horizontally. In the fall of that year, a tripartite agreement was signed between Volvo Car and Mitsubishi to create a joint venture called Ned Car, with each party owning 33%. 1994 was characterized by the modernization and re-equipment of several company facilities. At the Geneva Motor Show, the Volvo 850 T5R was presented, the most powerful production car from Volvo with 250 horsepower. It had several suspension changes, lower than the GLT, and design changes, a front bumper spoiler. The power was increased by 25 horsepower compared to the 850 Turbo due to the installation of a higher performance turbo and changes in the injection system control settings. The Volvo 850 became the first car in the world to have a side airbag in addition to the side impact protection system. In the summer, the Volvo 960 was introduced, which had a redesigned exterior and interior. This car had a new rear suspension, Multi-Link 2, which differed from the previous version by the absence of springs and their replacement with a plastic transverse leaf spring. The engine was offered, in addition to the 3.0-liter, with a 2.5-liter B6254F engine with 170 horsepower. In addition to the automatic, a manual transmission could also be installed. In September 1995, the new S40-V40 model was presented. This was the result of joint work between Volvo and 
and Mitsubishi. Along with this model, a new model designation was proposed where the letter indicated the body type. S, sedan, V, estate, and C, coupe or convertible, and the numbers indicated the model number. The new model was completely different from its predecessors in both design and construction and was intended to replace the 400 series. Three types of engines were offered for this model, 2 liter or 1.8 liter petrol and 1.9 liter turbo diesel. Side airbags began to be installed on all models from this year. 1996 was marked by the presentation of a large number of new models. In Paris, the C70 was presented, the result of joint developments between Volvo and TVR. The chassis and powertrain of this model were borrowed from the 850 series. The S70 slash V70 series was introduced to replace the the 850 series, which had significantly changed in body and interior design. The technical side remained unchanged, confirming the structural exclusivity of the 850 series that persists to this day. The 960 model was renamed the S90-Vive90 this year without significant changes. This year Volvo produced its 10 millionth car. The number of new models presented led to a significant increase in sales in various countries. The 40 series this year was additionally equipped with a high pressure turbocharged engine with 200 horsepower, a low pressure turbocharged engine with 160 horsepower, and a turbo diesel engine with 90 horsepower. From this year to the present day, a wide range of possible modifications of the 70 series has been widely represented. In general, concerning the S70, this is a wide range of engines offered for the sedan body, which are divided into five types of petrol engines with power from 126 to 250 horsepower, a diesel engine with 140 horsepower, and an engine with a dual fuel system running on petrol and methane. The S90 and V90 was discontinued in May 1998 and replaced by the S80 series, which would continue the design line of the 1996-97 models. However, it cannot be called similar to the already produced models. The exterior design of this car was based on elements from the S80. The S80 model offers four modifications of petrol engines ranging from 140 to 272 horsepower and one diesel engine with 140 horsepower. The drive of this model is front wheel. Undoubtedly, with this car, Volvo will enter the 21st century with dignity. Thus, at the moment, Volvo does not produce rear wheel drive cars. The rights to use the Volvo brand for passenger cars, minivans, sports cars, and minibuses were transferred to Ford. Volvo retained the rights to use the brand for all other areas of the company's activities. Since November 2000, the XC60 model has been on sale. This car is distinguished by a large number of devices ensuring excellent passenger safety and was recognized as the safest car in 2001. It is one of the most stylish and safest cars in the world, equipped with the most modern personal safety systems. A powerful body protection frame, reinforced with high strength steel and a glued windshield, deformation zones reducing impact force, dual threshold airbags, SIP system, inflatable curtain IC, and other elements deflecting and dissipating impact force. 2002 was a year of great changes in Volvo's product range. The first SUV, the XC90 was announced. The company's design studio had been developing its own SUV for some time. All leading European manufacturers, even Porsche, had prepared or started producing their own SUVs. Finally, in August 2002, mass production of the XC90 model began. The main market for these cars was chosen to be the USA, and only at the beginning of 2003 did deliveries of this model to Europe and Russia begin. The XC90 became a response to models like the BMW X5. In 2003, at the Geneva Motor Show, Volvo demonstrated its next concept from the series of visions of Volvo designers for future cars, the VCC Concept Car. In 2008, Ford sold Jaguar and Land Rover to India's Tata Motors, but it was decided to keep Volvo cars despite increasing losses and the economic crisis. The company's development plans were revised. In the same year, the new Volvo XC60 crossover was introduced. When the global economic crisis affected American car manufacturers, Swedish authorities became concerned about the company's fate in the event of Ford's bankruptcy. The situation worsened after massive layoffs at Volvo. The intention to sell the company was was announced in December 2008. 
The initial price was 6 billion USD. It was also announced that Volvo might become an independent company. The Swedish government was approached with a request to consider the possibility of state ownership of the company or financial assistance for Volvo and Saab. According to rumors, potential buyers of Volvo cars included German BMW, Swedish investor investor AB, as well as several Chinese and other investors. Also, according to rumors, the company was supposed to be acquired by Volkswagen, and despite initial denials, the deal was eventually concluded with the Chinese Geely Holding Group. According to some reports, Geely Group offered 1.5 billion USD for the acquisition of Volvo and investments from Goldman Sachs in the holding company amounting to 2.59 billion HKD. On March 29, 2010, the Chinese company Geely Automobile announced that it had reached an agreement to acquire Volvo cars from Ford Motors for 1.8 billion USD. The deal was closed in early August 2010. It is expected that all intellectual property rights to the Swedish company's developments will remain with Volvo, and Geely will have full access to them. From the beginning and to this day, Volvo is associated with safety and reliability. The team of car creators has proven that this brand truly deserves this title because they own most of the ideas that have saved the lives of millions of motorists. What will happen to Volvo next? This question worries many, but judging by the latest innovations and some information revealing future plans, it can be confidently stated that the Volvo brand, despite Chinese management is not ready to forgive competitors in the market, but on the contrary, plans to push many brands in certain car classes. Over the decades, Volvo has built a solid reputation as a manufacturer of very prestigious, exceptionally safe, and very reliable cars. At present, Volvo continues its active work on creating new models, focusing on their consistently high Scandinavian quality. The company's motto, Volvo for Life, perfectly reflects its fundamental principle, to create the safest cars for people. Well, that's all. Which brand's history would you like to see in the next video? Write in the comments, share this video with friends, and don't forget to like and subscribe to our channel so you don't miss interesting videos.